replace me. But with all of that said, thank you everyone for joining us today. Whether you're here in person or watching uh, online afterwards, it's our pleasure to get the chance to introduce to you one of our uh, entrepreneurs in residence, Sandy. Uh, Sandy is one of our EIRs who, uh, as I was just kind of talking to her in the, in the green room, so to speak, joined us during the pandemic. And so I'm really excited to be able to have her come and physically be at the DMZ, you know, potentially down the line once things settle down uh, a little bit more in the future. And so Sandy really has come to support our startups in many different aspects of marketing. Though Sandy, I'm sure in the conversations you've had with some of our founders, you know, while it might start in one area, it quickly goes into a much larger conversation. And so uh, it, we're really fortunate to have you not only as a part of the DMZ, Sandy, but here with us today to share a little bit more about yourself and how you can help our startups out in the incubator program. And with that said, again, thank you so much for making some time today. And I'd, I'd love to pass the floor over to you to introduce yourself and a little bit about how you can help our startups out. Thanks very much, Shane. So um, I'm not actually gonna talk that much about myself. I, I will tell all of you that I am a gray hair. I have been doing marketing for a very long time. Um, I will tell you that my career started long before the internet, um, but um, I do know some stuff about the internet because uh, five of us started an internet service provider in the early, early days, um, which we were fortunate enough to sell. I have worked for successful startups and I have worked for a couple of startups where they didn't go anywhere. Um, and I'll talk about sort of things to watch out as you think about marketing um, and some sort of gaps that we have realized over the years are super important. I also spent a good portion of my career at Microsoft, both here in Canada and what is in the US. And with, with that, I'm just gonna sort of jump in and I'm gonna speak really fast and I apologize for this, um, but there's a lot to cover off. And so really what I want, my hope is at the end of this presentation, you get three things that are useful to you. If you get more, that's amazing. If you get less than three, then I haven't done my job. But there's so much that's coming at you like a tidal wave. So, um, you know, and everybody has different levels of experience. So I'm really just going to give you this very general overview and touch on some key points. The first thing that I'm starting with, and, and I always start with this, is privacy. Privacy is the most important thing that you can think about in marketing. Actually, with regards to anything. Um, and it's really for you to know, um, for anybody that's looking to do any kind of a um, consumer or customer prospecting, you really truly need to understand um, privacy. I have a couple of documents that I will share with Shane um, that he can forward out. I have a really good privacy document that comes from the privacy commissioner. So you'll be able to so, sort of understand from their perspective, the in-depth um, um, document and all the steps within that. The, the first thing I'm going to cover off is what we refer to as PEPIDA. And PEPIDA is the per Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. And, and really, if you think about PEPIDA and you think about the governing laws of GDPR, which is really through EMEA and Europe, um, if you follow PEPIDA, you will be okay for GDPR. And really what it does is it applies to the collection use to, and disclosure of personal information in the course of commercial activity. So um, I hope that you guys can read this, but it's really, there are a number of, of requirements that, that you need to comply with. And really, if you think about it is, you have to obtain somebody's consent um, when you collect their information to sort of say, I'm going to now do something with your information. So if you're collecting somebody's information, be very transparent about what you're collecting, why you're collecting it and how you're going to um, use it. Also, People, anybody, if you collect my email, I have the right to come back to you as a company and say, how are you using my information? Where are you storing it? Or delete it. So just so that you know that if somebody sort of does do that, and that we do know of, of customers that are calling companies, literally are saying, your unsubscribe button doesn't work. I don't want to be in your database. Delete me from everything. Um, people can have the, the right to challenge the accuracy. Um, you can only use the personal information for the purpose of which it was collected, which is what I said originally. You need to tell people how you're going to use this information. And if you're going to use it for something other than you've collected it for, you need to go back to get that permission. And at all times, make sure that you're safeguarding and protecting everybody's um, personal information. 
So what counts as personal information? And, and you guys can read all of this, but it is literally everything about a person. So there is very little is not regarded as personal information. To me, it's just intuitive and it's common sense. Um, and again, if you're not really sure, this document that comes from the Privacy, Privacy Commit Commissioner will help you out. We then have a second law in Canada, which is called CASEL, which is the Canadian anti-spam law. So we have PEPIDA, which is the protection of my data, which is where you have unsubscribe um, buttons on emails and websites, et cetera. The anti-spam is where you may not contact somebody where you don't have previous consent. Um, this law has been around for a very long time. And I am telling you that the fines on this law are horrendous. So we know of companies that have been fined $10 million. We also know of a couple of startups that have been fined a million dollars. So don't think because you're a startup and you don't have any money in the bank that, they can't, that the commissioner won't come after you. If you're using and collecting information illegally, the commissioner will come after you. So just make sure that everything that you do is open and transparent and that you're doing it in the most legal possible way. So what constitutes spam? So really when we think about spam, it is, um, you know, sort of anything that is uh, unsolicited, email, text, phone calls, et cetera. You think about it, it is you, and in your own mind, you know what is spam. So it's just sort of translating what you know into your business um, ideal. So the question that we always go is, what is exempt from CASEL? So really what is exempt from CASEL and what is, not, what is not thought of as spam is where you've got consent, you know the person, they've done business with you previously in this company. So if they've done business with you in another company, you cannot port that information over. They need to have done business with you. Um, it's uh, if you were at a trade show or an event, somebody gave you their business card, that's viewed as consent. Um, it's it's uh, if somebody has their email information on LinkedIn, that's viewed as consent because it's publicly available. Uh, if you're renting a list, uh, please find out how that list provider collected that information. You have the right to see their privacy lists and how they're sourcing um, their lists. So from there, I'm going to really jump over into some marketing. So hopefully that was as clear as mud for all of you. And I'm just sort of going to give you some insights, some tips and suggestions, and a very high level on a whole lot of things within marketing. But the first thing that I really want to talk to everybody about is that when we think about marketing, it's about a shared goal, right? It's about our goal as a business, and it's about our customers' goals. And so what we really want to do is we want to create this shared experience. You know, forget for a moment that you're, that you're selling a service or a product and adopt the mindset that you're selling an experience. You really, really want to make sure that you're not just being about your company. It's the so what from a, from a customer's perspective. And I'll get into this a little bit more um, as I go along. So really the way to think about it is customer is king. The customer is in charge of um, the buying process. And you know, in today's environment, we really know that the customer has the ability to get information in any way that they choose. They can Google your company, they can Google reviews on you, they can ask people in their communities about you. So, you know, I always say to everybody, be very transparent when you're, when you're talking to prospects and customers. If a customer complains about you in any public forum, don't take the complaint down. Answer the complaint. Either say, hey, let's take this offline or respond, but don't make the customer the bad person. And there are bad customers, but you never want anybody to feel that if they do business with you, that they're not going to be supported through the purchase. It doesn't matter if they're buying a pen from you. They want to know when they buy the pen, it has ink and it's going to help them write something. So really customers have the ability to help you become successful, treat them very, very well. And there are days where you're literally wanting, going to wanna to take your mobile phone and whip it across the room because of a customer. Just remember they have the opportunity to make or break you. So from customers, I'm gonna jump into um, sort of product positioning. So it's all sort of connected because if we think about from a customer's perspective, they're gonna be buying your product. 
And what I've been seeing, and actually I just threw these couple of slides in this morning. And the reason for that was I was on a couple of calls this week with some of the founders. And what I've discovered is that the founders can't articulate to me their product positioning. You need to know the description. So the what, the who, and what's the problem that you solve? So what are your features and what are your benefits? And, and this is, I'm gonna show you an example sort of to help um, sort of clarify this a little bit, but I wanna sort of bring to everybody's attention. I'm working with a startup that's not within the DMZ group and um, they did a features benefit uh, sheet for me. But the benefits that they did was not the benefits that I, the customer would get. So it's a climate-based company. And so what they were saying were the benefits that the climate would have. Well, I'm the customer. And so while, yes, I'm very important that we focus on what the benefits to the climate are, that's not helping me in my job. So you need to get really, really succinct and clear. And, and I before you start jumping into doing Instagram ads and Facebook ads and all these amazing things, go back to your product and your product positioning. Is it really well defined? Do you know who your target audience is? And as you get learnings, you're going to pivot. So your target audience, you may have thought were males 14 to 22. And then you get some learning and you discover that it's actually 65 year olds. Those things are fine, but you need to really understand your market problem, your solution and your benefits. So I created this sort of as an example to sort of, because people were still having trouble in, in really understanding, um, you know, how to do this. So in this example, it's really about the business person who's starting a new company. There's software that produces a business plan. The, it's ideal for creating a plan quickly and easily. It's better than um, any of the competitors out there and name the competitors. And then why? It's a standalone product that requires no other programs to buy or learn. Another because it is easy to use, simple. It's a one-click process. It's, it doesn't require massive installation, whatever those things are. So I encourage you to really think about this. Um, it will help you as you articulate your marketing strategies. So again, while I'm beating this um, alive, it's figure out your positioning and your unique selling proposition. This is just a different way of thinking about it from a template perspective. It's for, so it's for non-technical marketers who struggle to find return on investment in social media. Our product is a web-based analytic solution that translates engagement metrics into actionable revenue, into actual revenue metrics. So again, it's about who's the customer, what's the need or opportunity, what's the name of your product, like what does it do, and what is the statement of benefit. So leading from there, you know, sort of when we think about features and benefits, and, and again, I come back to the startup that I was working with this week where they couldn't really articulate the benefits, the so what. So if you think about a feature, the feature is what our product can do. The benefits is here's what you can do with the product. It's the so what. So think about that always, like what, why am I doing this and what are my connection points? So really what's driving your message? So we sort of looked at this, this is um, a whole lot of different examples that I sort of scoured off, off the net, but you know, the feature of Greek yogurt is it's nutritious and it's packed with protein. The benefit is that it makes you healthier. Um, you know, uh, Kleenex, there are cushiony layers and they velvet to the touch. It'll soothe your nose when you have a cold. Our medicine has um, acetaminophen. It'll relieve your headache. So you, I think you guys probably get the gist of what I'm trying to say is what's the feature and then translate this into to, um, a benefit. So let's go back to our prospect or our customers. So, you know, a lot of people are not really sure about how to figure out their ideal customer. So we're going to, this is going to lead us to some persona work, but really it's about really getting clear at who you think your customer is today in your business. It may change, it may morph, it may, it may split off into 14 different types of customers, but you need to know who they are, why they're ideal, how do they buy, like, do they buy in store? Do they, are they digitally savvy? Like if you're going after a target audience that's 65 years old, they're not digitally savvy. So how are you going to support them? 
you know, what types of things do you think they do when they're, and this is just you making this up as you're going to get the learnings and the research will be able to modify it back. But how do they, like, how do they get their information? How many times do you think they would visit a website? Uh, where do you think they search for the information? When do they decide? Like, do they need, you know, is it a lot of encouragement? Is it, it's a one-time purchase, so it's a pretty simple thing. Um, and then understanding your competitors. So the number of startups and founders that I talk to who can't talk to me about their competitors uh, is astounding to me. You need to know where you're positioned against your competitor because I come back to transparency and customer. Your customer's doing all this work. They know who your competitors are. They know what your competitors' products are and they know how much they charge for them. So if your prospects and your customers know that, you also need to know that. So I say pay really close attention to that at all times. So I sort of mentioned persona um, and I'm gonna get into this a little bit, but it's really about sort of, you know, going back to everything that I just said, but this is just, it's developing a persona. So. In the next slide, I sort of help you through this, right? So start with real users. So start with Sandy, um, divide your audience into different groups. So she's female between the ages of 35 and 60. Um, you know, pick the best fitting group, create the main structure and then fill in your details gradually and then update as you learn more. So I have an example of a real case um, persona and it's Brandy Tyler. And Brandy Tyler has a problem with, with her feet and her shoes. So the company Monroe said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. She has narrow feet, she's a female, she's 36, she lives in LA and here's her job. They put in a picture of this person and they sort of said, her biggest problem is I can't find shoes to fit me. Then they sort of said, what's her motivation? What are her goals? What are her frustrations? And then sort of they took some customer feedback that they've gotten and they added it in. So when they're talking to their product development team, to their sales team, to their marketing team, this is what they're using to sort of say, here's one of our customers. So it makes it very real for people. And it helps when you've got a real image of a person to understand who they are, what they are, how they do things to be able to market to them. So going from our personas, we move into a sort of a funnel or a flywheel. So um, this really, this, this is the flywheel and HubSpot actually um, adopted this flywheel methodology. And I think it originally came from Amazon. Um, I don't love it, but it, it, and it all works the same, right? It's about, I need growth. I'm gonna attract, I'm going to engage, I'm going to delight. So it doesn't matter whether you use a traditional funnel or you use this um, flywheel, at the end of the day, we really are about attracting our customers, engaging our customers and delighting our customers. I like this model and, and it's the AARRR model. And really for me, why I like it is because it makes me think things through in buckets. It makes me think about acquisition. How do I find my users? What's my activation? What's my retention? Will they come back? Will I get a second purchase from them? How much money am I going to make? And how do I get um, referrals? So one of the things that we know that really, really helps us is if you have a satisfied customer, they can do the sales for you. So I'm gonna get into this a little bit more detail, but I wanted to quickly just jump to a digital marketing mix. So you can keep this in your back of your mind as I go back to this AARRR model. So really in the digital marketing mix, we have what I call three buckets paid, owned, and earned. And I would tell you that the most important one at the moment is your yellow bucket, the owned bucket. You own all these properties. You own your website, blog posts, profiles, emails, social pages. If you can get that to an amazing place, to almost a 90%, 95% um, satisfaction point, then I would sort of say to you, start thinking a little bit about the earned and the paid. But don't do anything in earned and paid. If your website's not properly, doesn't have enough content, doesn't have enough data in it, you don't have blog posts, et cetera. Your paid stuff, you, you should be testing at some point. Um, you know, Facebook ads, Google ads. I'm gonna get a little bit into more of the Google ads than the Facebook ads. 
um, you know, paid social as you get more money, but this is an expensive, paid is a very expensive way to go. On the earn side, it's can you get somebody to write a press release for you? Can you get somebody to write a blog post on your company on their website and link it to your site? Very important that things link back to your website. I will get into that. Google loves that. So as I said, I was going to get back to this AARR model, so um, which is a big mouthful. Really, when we talk about acquisition, it's about finding your customers. So think about how you get your prospects to your website. So organic search or SEO is the, the best way to do it. And the, the way that you do it with organic search is you have the right content. And I'll get a little bit into how SEO works and how to think about finding content, et cetera. But sort of these are all the different vehicles that you can use from an acquisition perspective. On the left-hand side, there are a couple of groups in that, and there is a cheat sheet or it's a summary sheet that has all of this in it for you that um, I, Shane will share with, with all of you guys. But they're just sort of different places for you to go. A lot of them are free for you to sort of find where your customers are and to ask questions. So really, we want to do activation. We want to convert our customers, right? So you want to be clear in what the conversion goal is that you're looking for. So how do you get visitors to take action on a website? You give them information, you tell them how you're different from your competitors, you have detailed product pages, you have valuable content, you encourage signups, you maybe encourage them um, to give you a profile and you give something of value in turn. I um, mean, you offer content that has strong calls to action. So these are the types of things to be really clear about. They're very easy to do. And again, it's all on your own website. So spend some time there. From there, we talk about loyalty, keeping your customers. It's so much easier to keep a happy customer than to win a customer. I, I can tell you that for 30 years I've been doing this and it's just easier to have happy customers. So things like, you know, um, if you're working with, a, if somebody's made a purchase, so I'm working with one startup and they had in their first week of launch, they sold a hundred units. And that was three months ago. And I said, okay, so how many of those people did a repeat purchase? And they said, oh, none. I said, well, how many would you have liked to have done a repeat purchase? Oh, 100. So I said, so what did you do to get those people to come back to, to your website to repurchase? And they said, oh, nothing. They were done the product, so they wish just order more. And I was like, no, you need to do some email marketing, maybe a special offer, some helpful content. You need to, to remind me. Um, and this one actually is a, is a food-based um, business. And so for me, it was amazing that they, they could have sent out some recipes, they could have sent out some health information, they could have had a nutritionist write a blog post for them and done it in an email. But if I've made a purchase, uh, keep me. So, you know, sort of think about how you're going to nurture and love me. Revenue, this is the question that you're going to get asked by anybody when you start looking for money. How are you staying in business? How do you get paid from a user's activity? So, you know, you all know this transcript, transactions, subscriptions, membership fees, affiliate fees, referral fees. Um, but you need to really make sure that you have good line of sight on how you're going to be growing your revenue. And again, this is, you know, so important. Understand what your competitors are doing. So these tools that are, are here are in the cheat sheet that I have for you, the summary sheet, so you don't have to scribble everything down, but they're really, really helpful tools to allow you to see what your competitors are doing. But I also say before doing all of that, just go to your competitor's website. What headings do they use? What calls to action do they do? Sign up for their newsletters, you know, shop, but don't purchase, leave it in, the, in a cart and see how they market to you um, and you'll be able to see their retargeting um, from that. So a couple of um, ad additional tools um, that I think are pretty cool. One is called SimilarWeb and it really shows how your competitors are doing. So this is what it looks like. It's a screen grab that I did. Um, you can use it for free for a certain amount of time. I'm not sure how long, but everything that I'm showing you does have a free trial period. There's another one which is free for always and that's Google Trends. So if you just type in Google Trends and you can explore what the world is searching. So here's what, what it looks like. And from there, I went and I said, okay, I'm going to do a search on um, educational resources. And so what it showed me was the interest over time. 
like how many people have been searching um, on educational resources? Where in the world are the top searches coming from? What are the related topics that people are actually searching from? And what are the related queries? So Google Trends is amazing, right? Like it gives you all this information and it helps sort of guide and steer you as you, um, as you sort of think through your strategies. All of this really leads us to our website, which is your company's front door. And I got to tell you, the most important thing is, is a website. I can't tell you how many websites I go to. And I'm like, on the first page, I'm unclear what you're selling. So don't make me work for it because I'm just going to go somewhere else. Be upfront, be clear. You don't have to have the snazziest website. It doesn't have to have the best videos and graphics and it needs to have the right content. So based on that, how do you make your website convert? You need to understand what your customer or prospect is, uh, what their journey is. So if you're selling a more complex product or service, they're not gonna do a purchase, a one-off quick purchase. If you're selling a pen, they're gonna do a one-off quick purchase. What they wanna know is, is there ink? What color is the ink? Is it a fine nib, a medium nib? And how's it gonna get delivered to me? But you sort of wanna make sure that you understand what your prospect is going to be doing. Make it very easy to navigate. Ensure that your, your speed, your pages load really quickly. Explain what you do. Have good call to actions. If you can offer a trial period or a guarantee, it's always helpful if you explain why you're better than your competitors without having to call out your competitors. You can say, you know, against companies that are similar to us. Um, this is where we where we are. And then use some short forms. So test fields to sort of see if you can gather some information about your prospects. So sort of here are a whole lot of, of um, website tips. And, and the first block that I have here is have a plan. Um, lots of people build websites without a plan. And so like that's ludicrous, right? It just write it on a piece of paper with, if you don't want to type it up, write it with a pen. What's my plan? Really? How do I want people to navigate? What am I going to do? What's the purpose? Um, you know, sort of what my call to actions that I'm going to be, um, you know, staying mobile friendly. Don't be afraid of having some white space. Fix, find and fix your 404s. No website should have a 404. There's a company that I'm working with. They relaunched their website last Thursday. Yesterday, we found 300 404s. Like, it's unacceptable. They don't even have that amount of pages. Like I was just like, this is, they just didn't take the time to do the upfront planning. So now, because they didn't do the upfront planning, they're going to be a week behind because now they've got to go and fix everything. So I sort of say that, you know, focus really on building things properly. You don't have to do it expensively, but just do it properly. Include FAQs anywhere on your website, put it in the footer, put it in your header, put it on your page. Um, it's a great way for Google and the search engines. Love, love, love FAQs. Um, so sort of those are the kinds of things, um, I just highlighted a few that you guys should be thinking about with your website. So, you know, one of the questions that I got was, well, how do I optimize my web page? So, so a company that I think is doing a really great job is Tire Butler. And Tire Butler, actually, they come to your house, they change the tires on your car, they will store the tires for you. They do a few other things. But if you type in Tire Butler, you can see their, the synopsis of their web page right on Google search, right? So it's optimized. Um, and so it really does, it tells me everything I need to know. Um, and it's got a little bit of the navigation. Their website actually doesn't have a lot of stuff on it. So I can just go to the pricing or the location. Um, and there you can see I can call them, et cetera. But you can do this with um, Google and it's really, really easy. And I say it's pretty important. The next thing I wanted to talk about was creating landing pages. So there's a company called Unbounce. Uh, it's the one I recommend to everybody. Um, and I recommend you do landing pages if you're doing an email campaign or any kind of marketing campaign, an Instagram campaign, and you're going to send them to your website versus sending them through Instagram. Why you want to have a landing page is it's going to allow you to have content that relates back to the promotional content that you had. So if you did an email campaign and you were talking about narrow fitting shoes in red and I got to your website and it's like we have shoes and there are all these different things. 
it's too hard for me to make the connection. But if I was interested in the red narrow fitting shoes, you on your landing page, that's the content that you would have. If you do that, you will drive much higher engagement. So when we think about um, landing pages, you know, sort of here's some sort of ideas for you to think about. Uh, always send email links to a landing page. Use some hero images, have a headline, so state the benefit. Tell a story of your product offering. It doesn't have to be in detail. Make sure you put your logo on, have an offer. If you can put a testimonial or a review, have a strong call to action, links to your social. And ensure that this page links back to the promotional material that um, sent, uh, drove to this particular landing page. I hope everybody's still with me and um, that I'm not speaking too fast. A couple of tools that I thought I would just throw in that um, I, I like, another one is Canva. So Canva also has a free trial period. Um, actually, I think you can use Canva for free as long as you don't use all the, the, the detailed um, offerings that they have. Um, but Canva is amazing. And it's idiot proof for people like me who didn't really grow up in this digital world. Um, and so if you're short and you don't know how to create a graphic and you don't want to use 99designs or Upwork or any of those guys, you can do it yourself using Canva. Great, great tool. And I'm not funded by them, by the way. So this sort of leads us to content. So your website's the most important entry into your business. But once I open the, the front door, everything inside uh, is the foundation, right? And that's your content. Content is the most difficult thing that everybody um, works on. Everybody is constantly saying to me, I don't have any ideas for content. I can't write, I'm a terrible writer. I'm gonna give you a couple of ideas and I'm gonna give you some tools that are gonna help you as well um, so as you think about uh, your content. But really content is king. So from content idea, make sure your content aligns to your business objectives. And, you know, we do the content really so that we become discoverable with the with search engines. So website copy, blog posts, ebooks, webinars, white papers. Um, these are all very time consuming. So if you write, if you have a white paper, you can repurpose that white paper into a website copy, your blog post. Um, you can do a, a tweet on it. You can do a LinkedIn post on it, a Facebook post, an Instagram, whatever it is. But think about how you take one piece of content and you pull it apart to give you other pieces of content. You know, and, and really think about it and, and be planful. You don't have to have new content out every single day. I see some founders that are killing themselves trying to post every single day. Really, your, your prospects don't care if you post every single day. As long as you post things that are relevant and pertinent to them, you'll be fine. So as I promised, here are a couple of ideas for you from companies. Again, this is all in this um, summary sheet, but there's keywordseverywhere.com. And this is actually, um, I only installed this a couple of weeks ago. It's an installation on Chrome that I did. And what it really does is it allows me to sort of figure out monthly search volumes, um, uh, keywords that are being searched on various different sites. It's very intuitive, very easy to use. And I personally think it's a really helpful tool to use. Um, another tool that um, this actually, it was a company called Sizzle. And I think Unbounce bought them um, or Unbounce had it as a separate company and brought them in. But I saw this a few days ago that they were now part of Unbounce. Um, but it's AI technology that will help you write copy. And I gotta tell you, it's really, really good. So it's not outstanding but it's, it's good. And so if you're short and you need some help with some copy, try them out, see how it works. And also the, the more you tell the tool, the better the content will come back to you. So why do we need all this content? We need the content because of SEO. Um, I get a million requests for SEO. People say to me, Sandy, how do we rank on the first page? All that kind of stuff. First of all, SEO is a very slow grind. It takes up to six months to a year before you will start seeing results. But once you start seeing results, you will never go back. Um, there is so much to cover off on this that I'm going to high level what um, my information, 
so that um, you've got some ideas and some suggestions. So really, SEO is about improving the quality and quantity of a visitors to a website. We know that 92.2% of all searches are done on Google, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't look at Bing, because what we do know about Bing as a search tool is that we actually get better transaction purchases of a, of a search that was done on Bing than we do on Google. So just keep that in mind at all times. Bing is not has not gone away. It's just much, it has less of a reach than, um, than Google does. So from an SEO perspective, here's some ideas. Um, I was like, okay, I'm a company and I've created a product that's going to remove red, white stain, red wine stains. So, okay, so I'm going to create some content and I sort of want to see what else is going on around that. So I type in the Google search bar, how do I remove red wine stains from clothing? It shows me a couple of articles. It tells me how many people have, have been searching for 28 million people. Uh, it tells me, it gives me a whole lot of content articles baking soda, toothpaste, all that. Uh, there's an article from the Spruce, which is a great, I can go read that article. Maybe I can connect this article to my website. That will help me. Um, and then it'll tell me about competitive products. And then it'll also tell me about the long tail words. So people, you know, sort of the SEO difficulty, the brand query, on-page difficulty. So that's a really good feature as well. So you can spend some time as you do some searches around this you can get a lot of content um, through this. There's also the Google auto suggest. So you start typing something in. So I started typing remove red wine and I stopped at the stain part. And it's given me a whole lot of ideas. I can do it from a carpet, a couch, a tablecloth, if the, if the carpet's dried. So here's some content articles that I can just start writing on from Google suggest. There's also the keyword tool.io, and um, this will help you with long tail. So this is more about how do you use um, sort of wording that is not that common and not that frequently removed. So I did removing red wine, and then it gave me 280 keywords um, of which I could sort of pick up and start using. So these are just some suggestions to help you guys as you're inundated with everything that you need to do. Um, again, this is all in the checklist, but I just wanted to call it out. Install Google Analytics, whether you use it now or not, it's going to become very important to you. Um, Ahrefs is, has a free trial. Sometimes it's seven days, sometimes it's 14 days, but it'll allow, it'll measure your keyword ranking and link building. Verify your site in Google Search Console. You want to make sure that your site is actually viewable. Uh, you want to know about your indexing. This is where you can find all your errors and your 404s, etc. You want to have a website performance um, speed that, again, go to the Google speed, Page Speed Insights. It'll tell you what your, your URL in. It'll tell you what your score is. Take the Google Mobile Friendly Test and make sure that you're using um, a buyer persona. So sort of to summarize on all this SEO, um, we want to sort of make sure we have a keyword strategy. We want to brainstorm for keyword ideas. We want to generate lots of different ideas. We want to find some ideas. Quora is a really great place for you to go and sort of see what people are talking about. You can ask a million questions there. Um, and you can sort of use all the, the Google keyword extension planners, et cetera, that are all free. They have amazing um, tutorials and guides if you're confused and don't know how to use something but most of it is really intuitive. So really what we want to do from a, an SEO perspective is we want to make sure that we, you know, we optimize, we reduce our bounce rates, we give a boost to our um, headings. So we, give an, uh, we make sure that we're tagging on our headings with H1s, H2. We want to make sure we have links. So I want to link to an article. I sort of spoke about the red wine article on Spruce. I want to link to that. I also want somebody to add a link back to, to our website that adds credibility. You can link articles on your website. Google likes that. Publish longer content. Use your share buttons, so your social sharing, and then double check everything. Double check for spelling. Make sure your links are all working, etc. And here are just a few um, additional SEO tips. Um, you know, keep your content refreshed. Google doesn't like it, uh, does not like stale content. So their web crawler will go out, it tags your content, 
and it understands how old the content is. You know, we've spoken about hyperlinks, uh, video, if you're using video, make sure you're adding tags into the video so it's discoverable. Um, you know, link to other websites, uh, find suggest words, do a study, um, add text um, to your infographics and your podcasts. Uh, you know, get backlinks, which is really about getting your site linked from somebody else's. Try and get featured in, in, in snippets. Get guests to write blog posts for you and link back to their website, their LinkedIn, etc. So this sort of then leads us to Google Analytics, which will really help you understand how things are performing. Um, and you know, I'm working with a startup now that has a marketing team of three, so it's a pretty big startup. Um, and they they were just saying to me, we don't have time to do the analytics. And, and I literally said, well, then you can't do any more campaigns. Because they've been spending some money, they've done some paid search, they don't really know what's performing. And so if you don't know what's performing, you don't really know what, what can be improved. So if at a minimum you can install Google Analytics and just track one or two things, you're going to be ahead of the curve. You don't have to Google Analytics, you can spend your life in it, and it's full-time jobs for people, but you just want to be able to get some directional um, ideas. So here's a screen grab of a Google Analytics dashboard, and I really want to know about how many unique visitors am I getting, how many visitors am I getting from SEO, how did the people find my website? So I sort of set this up in Google. It literally took me all of five minutes to do. And I can see that I'm getting most of my traffic's coming through organic. Um, I can see sort of which social networks are, are sending me traffic. And I can sort of see what, what's going on with my SEO. So there are a lot of tools for SEO. Excuse me, there's um, the Google Search Console, there's SEMrush, Moz.com, Saul, and Ahrefs. And again, this is all in this cheat sheet, but these are tools that are freely available to you. Um, some are free forever and some have free trials. I'm, I'm barely going to touch on um, sort of the paid side of things um, because you've got all this other stuff that you need to do before you start spending money on paid search. Paid search is really, really expensive. Um, Google Ads, as I said, it's, it's the most common. Um, it's good to, to combine your paid search with your organic search. Um, and you can measure your paid search so you know how, how they're doing. Um, so sort of things to think about. Paid search is better than organic in as much as it will drive qualified traffic to your website. You'll see immediate results. Um, you know, you just have to start with a, a, an account. So go to Google, their paid search, you set up your account, you can start running Google ads. They have a step-by-step -step process. It's really, really easy to use. Um, you want to find phrases that have significant search volume. However, know that that's very expensive. But you do want to use phrases that people are already using. So how it works is this tool will actually look at your ad, it'll look at your your um, search query, it'll look at the landing page you're sending to people, it'll assign a quality score from that. The higher the quality score, the lower the dollars you will spend for an ad. Straight off Google's website, I kid you not. Um, and then what happens with paid search is Google does a match of the paid keyword term that's being searched and it sort of does this exact match and then it serves it up. So. You know, if I'm searching and, and somebody else is searching, we don't always see the same paid search ads. It's dependent on how we're doing our search. Make sure if you are going to do paid search that you put some, uh, some, some copy below it, but below your keyword, like a descriptor line. Uh, make sure that they're limited to 90 characters or less. And again, Google has all of this. So you don't have to, you know, be like, oh my God, it's too much for me to remember. Um, it's all on the Google um, paid search website. So email marketing, I love email marketing. And, um, you know, we come back to our privacy guidelines. So make sure that before you send an email to anybody that they've opted in to receive some communications from you. So I'm going to give you some quick tips on, um, on email, but the most important thing you can do and your biggest asset in your company is build up an email list. Um, you know, email continues to outperform other channels. And here's the thing. I, you know, I love Instagram and I think TikTok's doing some interesting things, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, 
The problem with those platforms is they're owned by other people, right? So they can change the algorithm and they do on a regular basis. So Facebook changed the algorithm of who's going to see your content and who isn't going to see your content. So you can't control anything that you don't own. So you can control your website and you can control an email list and you can control your own social assets, but you can only control them as long as you're playing within the sandbox that the social sites have allowed you to play in. So think about things that you own and how you can best use them. So, you know, email, it'll get people back to your website. Um, make sure that you're sending emails that your customers want to receive. Use strong subject lines. And then, you know, again, follow privacy. Um, you know, and here is sort of just reiterating what I've sort of said before. You can follow up with your visitors. It allows you to nurture your leads. And it, you can get them back to your website um, for a sale. So there is an approach called the AIDA approach. And, and I didn't make this up. This is a, you can Google it, you'll see it's there. Um, but it's really about having inter attention, interest, desire, and action. So as you write an email, think about this approach. So I did a screen grab of a company that I think is doing a pretty good job of it. The attention was 44% of mobile checkouts are abandoned. Find out why. That got my attention, right? Like, oh my God, that's probably happening to me. Then they sort of put into their um, copy, they sort of put some interest. Then they sort of gave me the desire that makes me want to learn more. And then they said, there's an action. Get the report to learn more. And here's, they've got here, sort of grab your copy. And they've got, yes, please send me the latest industry insights by mail, by email. Get the report. So the report's actually downloaded, but they will also email it to me. So I use this, I think it's a really clear example of when you're thinking about writing emails, these are the kinds of things to think about. So sort of, again, you know, make sure that you have permission, build your list, have an opt-in on your site, add something of value in order to capture somebody's email address, select your email provider, MailChimp, Constant Contact, HubSpot, um, segment your list if it's large enough, and if it's not, please do not test 12 things to a base of 50 people. Even there's a company that got 2,600 uh, contacts and they're doing an email drip campaign and they're testing six different things. That's far too many things to be testing and it's only 2,600 people. So maybe send, you know, two different subject lines to 1,300 and then, and then use the right subject line. They've got more action on the website and use that as the one. Don't do these, don't get overcomplicated in all these scientific tests. Like everybody's always be testing. Only just test one thing, get some learning, move back forward. Make sure you have a link for unsubscribe, please, please, please. Um, have a catchy subject line. Uh, we spoke about that earlier. If you go to MailChimp or you just Google MailChimp subject line resource, they have an unbelievable document. It has so many suggestions. It's incredible. And, you know, I'm a big believer and you don't have to invent things. You can take things and improve on them and modify them. Um, and then also test to find out what's the best time to send an email. Avoid a Monday morning because people have inbox overload and a Friday afternoon because most people are out of the, out of the office and they're checking out of their inbox. So a couple of, hit, of tips, uh, you know, use numbers in your headline, 21 actionable steps, top 10, 10 reasons, um, fix common mistakes, you know, keep your headline to 50 characters, be specific, use some images. Uh, use strong call to actions. So have a call to action. Decide on the action you want your customer or prospect to take. Start with a verb. Download, subscribe, shop. Create a sense of urgency. Make it visible and minimize the risks. So money back, trial periods, et cetera. So hopefully you've got an idea or two for email from there. I'm going to jump into social media and I'm actually not going to spend all that long on social media. Uh, that in itself is, you know, a six hour session. So just very quick sort of, we know by 2022, over 82% of internet traffic will be online videos. Start thinking about doing videos. They do not need to be high production videos. If somebody tells me they want their videos should look like Wealth Simple's videos, I'm going to tell you that Wealth Simple spends a million dollars on their videos. They have a production studio in New York 
I am a massive Wealth Simple fan. I, um, as a company, I think they've done outstandingly well. Know that they've raised over $100 million. They are not the same as all of you. So please don't use them as your benchmark, but you definitely can use them as guidelines as things that they've done right. But they did a lot, a lot, a lot of video. There are a lot of ways for you um, to use video. There are a couple of companies actually within DMZ that are video and um, producers and are doing like offers to, to all the founders at DMZ. So sort of reach out to Shane. I'm sure he can help you. And if he can't, I can put you in touch with those companies. Again, I have no affiliation to them. It's just sort of a, another resource to you guys. Um, I came across this tool, vidIQ, which is a tool for YouTube. Um, and actually, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and so I encourage you to go and have a look at it. Uh, it, it really will give you some insights into creating your videos um, on YouTube. So pretty cool tool. And again, it's on the it's in the link document. Um, Social media, six out of 10 of people are active on social media. You all know the channels of where people are hanging. Uh, if you are B2B, uh, probably uh, Facebook isn't going to be where you want to be and probably not TikTok. If you are a consumer-driven brand, you probably don't want to be um, on LinkedIn. So think about where your target audience is. Develop a strategy, be consistent in your messaging, and keep your username across all your social platforms. Um, you, you don't need to post every day. Your target audience isn't looking for stuff from you every day. So as long as it's relevant and as long as you post at least once a week, you'll be fine. Uh, you know, write compelling about and profile sections. Uh, create a calendar so that you know what you've got to do so that you can be planful and it's not last minute. And post things that are of value. So if you think about something that you, you've thought, you know, oh, on Instagram, I'm going to follow that company. Why? What was it about them that made you want to follow them? And then just parlay that into your business. It's just common. Marketing really is a lot of common sense. Um, you know, and, and for, for social media, there's really no one shining bullet. But you want to engage. You absolutely be authentic create conversations. There's so many amazing things that you can do, specifically on Instagram. I am really amazed at some of the amazing things that people are doing with polls and Q&As and live videos. Um, follow influencers in your industry. Keep an eye on what they're doing. Follow your competitors. Join groups that are related. So, you know, on LinkedIn, amazing to me, the number of groups and conversations that you can see and you can actually, you know, sort of, I spend a lot of my time just watching. What's the conversation? What are people asking in this area? Oh, I could create some content around that. I can create a blog post around that. So you can sort of think about things there. And then just remember to use um, your hashtags. And there are all these hashtag tools. And again, in my summary sheet, um, there, there is some hashtags. So that leaves exactly four minutes. Um, for questions, three minutes. I apologize. Um, I tried to go as quickly as I could possibly go. Um, I hope that this was valuable and that you got at least three things out of this. Yeah, and, and if I, I may uh, jump in. Yeah, if I may jump in here, because I know three minutes is not a lot of time to uh, pick your brain. I, I put it in the chat, but the uh, kind of summary of, of tips and tricks that Sandy mentioned is attached to the actual uh, Google Calendar invite as an attachment. So all of you should have access to it as well. Uh, some of you have already been assigned to work with Sandy, but for those of you who don't and want more than two minutes to work with her, uh, I believe you're available from Tuesdays to Fridays and you pretty much kind of have flexibility between I, those Yeah, so, and I want to apologize because there are a few people on here that I see who've had their meetings moved around. So typically meetings get booked in my calendar, but I, um, I work with DMZ and I'm, I'm very happy to be working with DMZ, but I also have a couple of my own. I'm a fractional CMO to five startups. And so I sort of have to net manage. And so I apologize always when I'm moving a meeting. I am using Calendry, so I am trying to get it when it works for all of you guys. If I book a meeting and it doesn't work for you, you have my email address, feel free just to email me back or go back to Shane and, and um, his team can help you. Perfect. Awesome. And, and maybe just uh, the last thing I'll say, Sandy, from a conversation you and I had is, you know, the, 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 the wrong approach to bring to you, like, I need to be on SEO, the first page today, like, like, what would you use as a great example of what not to bring to you, as opposed to then, you know, the best type of question to perhaps bring to you? 
So here's what I would tell you is I can't help you create a Facebook ad. I, I literally can't do it. I have no interest in knowing how to do it. I know I do know how to do it. I just have no interest in doing it, right? So, and that's not valuable to you guys. Um, it, it's really about the problem that you're trying to solve. If there's, you know, I've tried this or how do I approach this? Or let's talk through my positioning or let's talk through my persona. Um, or here's, you know, I, Sandy, you said A and five other experts have said B. So why did you say A? Let's have the conversations around that. Um, but, and the other thing is I can't find your customers for you. I can give you lots of ideas and suggestions, but I can't find your customers. So, you know, I, I, I have startups that say, I don't know how to get a customer. I don't know how to get a customer either. And if I did, I would be a multi gazillionaire. I just know logic, right? So I always say, don't come panicked and, but come with some good questions. Um, you know, and also what's helpful to me is if you can sort of give me the quick synopsis of. I'm a first time founder, I'm a 12th time founder. This is what my company does, just so that I've got a quick update. I typically try and go and find your companies, but some of you are on a Gmail address. And so it's hard for me to understand who the company is. Perfect, awesome. And I think with that, we've hit time because I know you've got a hard stop at uh, 2 p.m. And so I'll stop the-